How long have you guys been doing Tinkara fishing and what's kind of, give me a, give me a little bit of a background. Um, I've been doing Tinkara, I guess, for about a year, mm -hmm. but I was fly fishing quite before a bit before that. Before yeah. that, okay. Yeah. Nice. Same, I've been uh, uh, probably about two years now. Okay. Um, mainly Tinkara fishing, but I've been fly fishing and, and, and yeah. fishing my whole life. So that, it kind of came, the fishing part comes naturally, the Tinkara specifications and technicalities are what, yeah. what I yeah. need to learn more about. Well, what I, what I was going to do for the advanced class um, is uh, um, really kind of focus on uh, um, aerial mending, ultimately. Um, that's kind of the, the magic that really sets, uh, you, know, uh, you know, more advanced Tenkara fishermen uh, apart from, from, you know, people that are beginners or just have never, you know, chosen to, you know, kind of take their skill to the next level. Um, you know, to get there, I always start by saying, you know, there are three things that we teach that you have to, you know, kind of be a student of if you're going to be a good fly fisherman, regardless of whether or not it's Tenkar or anything else. And that's ichthyology, hydrology, and entomology. So you got to learn about fish, you got to learn about the water and how it moves over land, and you got to learn a little bit about bugs. Um, and it's actually in order of that, that's the order of importance, you know. So start off, you know, concentrating on learning about fish, then concentrate on the water that they live in and that you have to interact with, um, and then a wee bit about bugs. As far as today's lesson goes, the only thing you need to know about bugs is that uh, a lot of the bugs that uh, are, you know, the benthic insects that, that, you know, trout tend to feed on in places like, you know, the Smokies here, uh, they do all kinds of shit in addition to uh, dead drifting, okay? There's a wee bit of dead drifting. A lot of them are crawling and, and you know, only dead drift when they, you know, when something goes hideously wrong. Um, there's very little behavioral drift, which is intentional drift, um, uh, compared to just, you know, catastrophic drift where they're knocked off and, and you know, head downstream. Um, you know, a lot of mayfly, a lot of, you know, some mayfly, some stonefly, some caddis are very strong swimmers. They'll swim up, you know, upstream. Um, uh, some caddis will actually parachute themselves on silk lines uh, to move, you know, from one rock downstream to another rock. Mm. So you can imagine what that's gonna, you know, gonna right. look like and how skate, we can that's the way to skate, right? right that's the way yeah, to skate. yeah. So there's, you know, bugs do all kinds of stuff other than just tumble helplessly. Um, you know, they were built for this environment and they figured it out, you know, one way or another. Um, so that's about all you really need to know about, you know, entomology yeah. for now. Um, when it comes to the fish, uh, you know, knowing about uh, the senses is really important if you want to start to uh, sort of up your game. You know, most people have an idea of where to find trout in the water, right? I, I like Dave Whitlock's breakdown, CSF, you know, CSF is a flow in a stream. Um, Dave Whitlock broke it down as CSF, comfort, safety, and food. Um, and we actually like to grade water, you know, based off of that comfort, safety, food thing. So we say, you know, that's a, that A, B, or C. That's an A, that's an A lie. That's a B lie. That's a C lie. A lie, I'm gonna spend a little bit more time on. B lie, few casts, you know, move on. C, maybe a cast or two, you know, and then I'm, yeah, and then I'm done. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, so, you know, that part most people get, but people usually don't, uh, you know, even the guys that can tell you Latin names of bugs they usually can't tell you a whole lot about the fish themselves. So real quick, we'll just take five minutes because, you know, these lessons can, you know, boost your, uh, your, your you know, catch rate a little bit, the, the, your percent chance of, you know, tricking a fish. Um, you know, trout have really good eyesight and everybody learn, learns about eyesight and Snell's window and all that other stuff. Um, don't worry about the UV thing. Doesn't really make, like, doesn't work that way. Um, uh, you know, like they, don't have, they don't have, eyes. they don't really have UV they don't vision. Really have UV vision. No, oh, really? no, uh -uh. yeah. A lot of people think they do, but and a lot of people sell shit that <laughs> yeah, way, yeah. Um, <laughs> but but not really. Um, the uh, uh, you know, I, I'm not, I won't talk about sight as much because most people, especially if you've been fishing for a while, you know, you've seen that diagram of Snell's window, you've seen that diagram of like, you know, stay you know, below the 15 degree mark or whatever. I am gonna give you a couple little 
like corrections to some of that stuff though. Um, you know, you always see that diagram where you've got a fish, right? And you're looking down at the fish from on top and they draw this, you know, circle with a little 60 degree or 30 degree, you know, pie slice missing out of the back. And they say the trout's blind there, uh, you know, approach trout from, that's why we move upstream, right? They, they are facing upstream and that way they can't see us because we're sneaking up from, from behind. Bull fucking shit. Like that's totally false for two, a couple reasons. Number one, that's a static diagram. A fish is never static in the water. As they're sitting there finning, they're constantly checking their six. And so they fill in that pie slice over and over. But on top of that, trout can actually move and pay attention to the pictures from each eye separately. So if you watch a trout, you know, in a feeding line, they'll swap one eye looking forward, one eye looking back, one eye looking forward, one eye looking back. And only when they see food and need their stereo vision to key in on it, will both eyes snap forward and go, you know, for the take. So they're constantly filling that in. So you have to keep your stealth up regardless of whether or not you're approaching from behind or approaching from the front. Yeah, absolutely. Which brings us to another thing, barrel reception. You know, people talk about the, that lateral line all the time, right? Um, the thing about the lateral line is it's not just the lateral line. Those receptors are actually all over their body. They've got a mask, literally, of those receptors that go around the eyes, around the jaw, everything else. Theoretically, those barrel receptors, theoretically, are sensitive enough to feel a mayfly's beating wings on the surface of the water. Um, I think they can probably detect barometric changes in the in the weather. If, if you fish on tailwaters when they generate, right. that's, you, you definitely yeah. believe they yeah. can. Um, you know, they also that's also how they you know they use that baroreception to to in part assist in finding food when the visibility is low. Mm -hmm. um, they use it to position themselves you know, next to rocks, they use it to, you know, that's, that's how one fish next to another fish can, you know, swim, you know, in sequence, right, or in, you know, in tandem. They're feeling that pressure change as the, as an object comes towards them. Uh, the interesting thing about that for us, um, I, I'll give you kind of two, pra there's more practical lessons to that, but I'll give you two practical lessons that can, that can help out quite a bit. Both are sort of advanced lessons. Um, one is if you're fighting a fish, um, you know, any of you that have heard me talk before, uh, you know, on the more basic stuff, um, I talk about using the rod as a tool. Um, you know, you keep in the power curve, you fight your fish. Um, we steer fish. We use this as a long lever arm. And by going back and forth, you can literally, in, you know, influence where the fish is going to swim and you can steer your fish. There's this other thing that happens where if you flip back and forth a few times, um, not super fast, but you know, with a little bit of speed. Um, sometimes the trout will go totally limp and you can just pull them through the water. Like they just, I mean, uh, and they just bullet through the water. That I, I, I've, I've postulated and spoken to a bunch of biologists about this. That is likely basically you hit and control alt delete on that barrel receptor, barrel receptor system. So all of a sudden they just go freaking limp and you pull them through. Um, that, uh, that limp, uh, um, uh, you know, body position or whatever posture actually uh, has a name. It's called a Carmen gait. Um, this guy figured out that uh, first in rainbow trout, then in brown trout, and, hen and since in brook trout and a bunch of others. Um, you know, when we're looking at the water, you know, looking for the best water to fish where we think the fish are hiding, a lot of people look for that two feet per second water. You know, the water that's moving a little bit slower than we would walk on a sidewalk. Um, and that's, you know, supposed to be where the trout is, you know, uh, you know, can take it easy and, you know, jump over and feed right, yeah. Um, and that's true to an extent, but actually what the Carmen Gate told, taught us is that that isn't the most, most efficient spot for a trout. The most efficient spot for a trout is actually smack dab in the middle of the turbulence. Yeah. The big ones on the back side of the rock. Yeah. Or the little ones back side, big ones front side. Sometimes, yeah, sometimes. They're, the other thing that will happen though is those those biggest guys, if yeah. you have a, a plunge and you've got that super gnarly white foamy yeah, crap. Fish, yeah. Stuff, yeah. yeah. Sometimes those big guys will actually be facing the opposite direction yeah. downstream. Uh -huh. Or they'll be fishing sideways or they'll they'll be holding sideways. And when they're holding there, they're in that Carmen gate. They're totally limp. 
and they it's like a helicopter hovering right yeah. like total state of chaos the the they're yeah they're just limp yeah. and they find that one magical spot for their body habitus you know their shape their size where they can just expend zero energy and essentially hover <laughs> That, that's the true waste. Right. right, yeah, the, yeah, right. Waste. Yeah, it's yeah. just in, absurdly efficient. Yeah. Yeah. So sometimes, you know, and, and I've often caught larger fish this way, if I have, I don't, there's nothing like this here, but if I have a really nice, you know, cut, yeah. You know, everybody everybody fishes everything else and maybe you're, you know, casting above and letting your, you, you know, letting your fly pop over to try and get it deep, you know, because you, you want these fish that are downstream of that. But every once in a while, walk up to that plunge and cast sideways yeah. so that your fly is oriented like, you know, if the water is spilling over the plunge here, your fly lands and it's sideways of that line. I see a lot of that with dry fly fishing. Yeah, uh, they'll do the same thing. Because you know, you, you, you can imagine that, that, that thing that you're describing, there's usually some dead water to the right or left, mm -hmm. just where it's sitting, it's sitting it's right there. Yeah drop them dry right there and they'll come out from the side pocket yeah right and yeah I've seen that um so that's kind of just two quick lessons on you know practicality of barrel reception um smell is a big deal um you know remember you know there are you know salmonids that go out into the ocean you know they're born in a river they go out in the ocean they find their way back and at some point it's actually the sense of smell that leads them back to the same stretch of water that they were born so that's a pretty fucking powerful sense of smell they uh, key in on amino acids more than anything else. Um, you know, take that into consideration too. You know, if you've been, you know, uh, you know, if you've been eating a, you know, a, a, you know, an epic jerky bar, um, and you tie on your fly, maybe you're giving yourself a little advantage. Um, you know, on the flip side, if you just, you know, uh, smoked a cigar or or you know, put on suntan lotion or something else. You might be at a significant disadvantage, you know, you know, rigging with all that crap on your hands. Do you think float has a has a deal with that? I I I, most I, I think so. I, I can't imagine that it. You know, it there's got to be some smell there. Right. I don't know if it really matters. Right. Probably, you know, the thing is, is I think everything matters at some point. At some point, right? Um, you know, the question you have to ask for yourself how is how. Fish. Yeah, yeah. And how many how many of these things am I going to pay attention to to stack it in my favor? Right. And how many, for me personally, are just too much of a fucking pain in the ass yeah. to bother with, yeah. you know? A wet fly is right. one of those. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so, you know, I, yeah, I, I do not carry floating. I, I do have the habit of walking up to a stream, um, you know, uh, in the beginning of my fishing session, taking a minute to look around. And part of it is just, you know, getting the feel, observing, you know, maybe I do flip over a couple rocks or like, you know, grab some gravel and see what's going on. But what I actually do is wash my hands in that water. And when I tie my fly off, I'll take that fly and I'll just go ahead and like, you know, wash it in the water and grind a little bit of, you know, whatever's around, you know, in that, in that riparian environment on there. Um, you know, I think it makes a difference. That you know, it's sense. one of those things, you know, it's a, like I said, everybody decides for themselves how much, you know, no, what, how they want to stack it. Um, so yeah, smell's really important. Um, the last one is hearing. And yes, they do have ears. Um, they're internal ears, um, and and they're quite powerful ears. Um, obviously, in something like this, when there's a lot of you know background noise, uh, you know you might be able to get away with a little bit more. Um, but do not think, you know, splashing through the water, you know, running up a gravel, you know, bank, all you know, with the big giant, you know, uh, Frankenstein wading boots that you know we use. That that matters. That will. You know, spook fish, it will turn off fish. Not always, not in all waters, but there are times when it will. And so if you don't just, you know, consider these things, um, you know, it, it, these are the kinds of things where you stack, if you stack the deck in your favor by paying attention to this stuff, you know, it, it, it turns a, a two fish day into a six fish day, you know. You're still going to catch fish. But if you really want to, you know, stack the odds in your favor, you just start paying attention to this little stuff. Yeah, it seems like trout takes on a little bit more of a hunting approach. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. So, so that's what we're going to talk about with trout. Move to hydrology. Um, hydrology uh, is, you know, uh, the movement of water over land, um, and uh, and you really have to understand, uh, you know, um, the the physics behind it a little bit. For a lot of people, it's it's almost intuitive, um, but some people really struggle to understand, you know, uh, you know how the pressure, you know, changes 
you know, in different situations and everything else. Um, you know, you can imagine if we have a boulder, you have that water coming from, from the front here. The water hits the boulder and there's a compression zone in front. The water in that compression zone really doesn't move too much. And then the water around it breaks free, you know, and, and, and comes around, right? And then after it breaks free and comes around, that actually leaves a little bit of a vacuum on the back end. Um, some soft water, usually with quite a bit of turbulence as it, as it peels back. Um, then, it, you know, that, that uh, separated current comes back together, uh, you know, and, and continues on, right? Um, a trout, unless they're in that Carmen gate, will rarely be right up against the back of the boulder, um, unless they're in that Carmen gate. Usually, feeding trout will be backed off a little ways where that water, you know, starts to come back together. Um, you know, maybe if it's a long enough turbulent zone, there's some soft water there, you know, where, you know, right before the, right before it comes back together, but they won't be right up against the rock. So you think that's a big difference in the key, like different days of fishing when they're, when they're willing to go out and hunt for the food or when they're, when they're yeah. just being like, I'm just going to sit in the right. gate and have a food piece of food. Floats by, I'm going to get it. Yeah. Like a lot of, a lot of the trout, the trout that I caught this morning, only one was in open what like well there was a there was a strike that I missed and only one of the fish that I landed was actually you know took in open water right. like took in a feeding lane the other trout were still in oh, hiding like, like an impulse yeah right. the other trout were still in hiding zones you know from the high water um, uh, you know so I, once I figured that out I started to really key in on on structure right. and you know figure you know hit hit those Carmen Gate zones yeah. you know hit the rocks with the undercuts really pause a fly in front of a right. you know in front of a rock things like that so yeah the feeding trout will be back here they will also be at the sides of the rocks so, that, so you know never ignore the sides of the rocks um, remember to always lead the fish so if i want to fish the side of a rock you know i've got a cast up here you know to get it there um, don't forget that the top of that boulder experiences the same forces so what you actually have is, you know, water coming down. You have that zone of compression where there, hardly anything is moving and you have that turbulence on the backside. But as the water rushes above it, it actually speeds up. And if you think you are getting a good drift, you know, if you're fishing for a fish over here and you have, say, a submerged boulder and you allow your fly to just go straight over that boulder and you think that you're, you know, keeping your fly at depth to get to that fish. You, you, yeah, you, it probably shot past because of that speeding water. That's a possibility. So in situation, the other thing that'll happen is if you, you know, if you're fishing for a fish here and you've got that water coming and you try and, you know, the water is going in this direction. And then as it goes around the rock, it's going in this direction. If you try and cast into this water, you know, from, from that angle, yeah, you'll get drag. And chances are, you know, you're going to get cross current drag from when that, you know, turns. And chances are you're not, your fly's not going to, you know, nicely wrap around the boulder like a normal piece of food. It's going to smack against the, you know, rock or it's going to get yanked out. So um, in order to play with depth and in order to uh, align our fly um, or, or get those, you know, supernatural drifts, we have to do something. Um, that essentially negates the fact that the fly is tethered, right? Like, what's the, what's the purpose here? We want to trick fish into thinking that our fly is the real deal. Um, you know, the problem is, is our fly doesn't weigh the same as the real deal. Even our, you know, weightless kabari still weighs more than a lot of those bugs. Um, and, and it's tethered all the, all the time, and there's nothing you can do about that. So if you want to get really good dead drifts, you know, people talk about, you know, manipulating flies and dead drifts. And people get super excited in Takara about manipulation. Um, but there's this really great Confucius-esque saying, uh, you know, the absence of uh, uh, all movement is the first lesson in The absence of manipulation is the first lesson in manipulation. Right. If you really want a good dead drift, you're going to have to manipulate that fly in a manner that negates the tether that, that's attached to it. So in these, in these scenarios, uh, in order to do that, in order to get it deeper, um, in order to get it to wrap around that boulder, um, we use aerial mending um, to align the fly, throwing these crazy loops in our lines. 
And by throwing those crazy loops in the lines, I can get a fly to either align in a current and negate that cross current drag. I can get it to sink deeper or I can keep it shallower. So when you watch videos of, of guys like, you know, my teacher, Masami Saki Kubara, and he, you know, casts out a size six Oni Kobari and floats it on the surface in one cast and the next cast it's four feet deep and then he floats it again and then it's four feet deep again and you're like, what the fuck is going on? All he's doing is playing with current. He understands hydrology, you know, I mean, the, the dude literally will toss a leaf into the water and watch it go downstream and then pick up a stick and toss a stick in the water to see how it's different, you know? Um, so he understands hydrology and he understands how to, how to manipulate his cast you know, to, to get what he wants. Um, so that's the rest of what we'll concentrate on is, you know, marrying this ichthyology and hydrology, you know, where the fish hang out, how to approach them stealthy, uh, you know, with our understanding of hydrology and using aerial mens to present the fly in different ways. Uh, all right, did you ever do a, a much like aerial mending when you were fly fishing done, previously? Yeah, some. Yeah. Yeah. What what kind of scenarios would you? Um, if there was um, maybe I was going across across a current and I wanted it, I didn't want to get the drag. I might try to get the part that was going to be in the faster section up higher. Yeah. And on the other side a little lower so that they eventually catch up. With right. Exactly. Other. Yeah. Yeah. So you kind of give it a little whip. Yeah. While it's in the air, yeah. you know, yeah. some people will do. You know, there's mending yeah. while it's on the water, and yeah. then there's mending while yeah. it's in the air. So Since I we I find when I'm mending the water, I'll end up. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, a lot of times when you do. When I do this, I end up wrapping myself up in it. Yeah. So with, you know, I think that the biggest potential advantage in traditional Tenkara, the modern Tenkara, is the uh, is the use of ultralight, you know, rigs. Mm. So we can hold the line off the water. We don't have to worry about, you yeah. know, mending once it's on the water. But we sure as shit need to mend in the air mm. if we're going to really catch more fish. You know, that's like I said. This is this is the mark of advanced versus not advanced. Is is watching people do those those mends. Um, the last chunk of hydrology that we need to understand before I start showing you some of this stuff is, you know, remember that in general, um, you know, you've got what's called the wetted perimeter. So if we if we take this you know stream and we slice it like a loaf of bread, and we look at one of those slices, you know, in front of us. You have the wetted perimeter, which is the sides, the bottom, and the other side, right? And then you got some rocks and shit in the middle. The farther away you are from any of those things, the less friction the water is going to experience, the faster it will go. So in general, the surface water, and maybe just below, is going to be the fastest that you encounter. A little bit deeper, a little bit slower, and down at the bottom, it may not be moving much at all. Again, why sometimes fish, you know, will hold in the bottom of riffles because they can just hug the rocks and the water's not moving that much because there's all that friction against the bottom. Uh, so we need to understand that and we need to understand how that water moves around, you know, objects uh, in order to figure out how we need to cast and, and you know, sink flies or, or you know, uh, get those good drifts or anything else. Um, how many of you guys saw me fishing earlier? So I, it, I, it was, I'm sure it was difficult to pick up on, but uh, um, I say that only because it took me like two years of watching Oni before I knew what the fuck he was doing. Um, and, and, but then it dawned on me. When Oni approaches the water, he maps out the water, all right? And he has every likely lie within, he does it by beat. And what I mean by that is like, okay, I can cast it as this much water. Um, I'm gonna make an instant mental map of every likely lie on that water. And then I'm going to go through in every single one of those likely lies where I think there's a, a good chance at a fish. I'm going to try presenting the fly upstream shallow, upstream deep, downstream shallow, downstream deep, with and without manipulation. But the thing is, is it can't be done in that order. Because if you do, you blow a whole bunch of water. So what you do is you hit, you know, before you step in, maybe you hit this, you know, upstream shallow, upstream deep. Maybe as you step towards it, there's some water down here, and you go ahead and hit that, you know, downstream shallow, downstream deep. Um, you step in, you fish above you, you know, upstream shallow, upstream deep. Then you remember that you did that, go over, fish these other two pools, and by the time you're in the right position, you then turn around, remember that likely, first likely lie, and clear it the rest of the way. And the order that you do that in, you know, as far as what hole you're hitting when depends really on stealth, right? Like, how can I move through this and give myself the, 
you know, cleanest, you know, access to each one of these. Um, the other thing, uh, that, uh, um, shoot, lost my train of thought there. Oh, okay. So, so how are we going to do that? How are we going to do upstream, down, shallow, upstream, deep, downstream, shallow, downstream, deep, all that other stuff. It's again with these aerial meds. So as far as the sinking goes, um, if I land my fly, say the water's moving in this direction, okay? And, uh, you know, we know that the, that the water on the top of the column, I'm going to do it for you guys. So the water's moving in this direction, all right? This is the top of the water. This is the bottom, all right? Um, if I cast and I land my fly upstream of my line, right? And, I, and I'm trying to get that fly to sink, as that fly sinks, my tippet any, and any line I got in the water is caught in that fastest current and will not let that fly sink to a certain degree, right? Mm -hmm. If I do the opposite, if I cast in a manner where my fly lands downstream of my line, then the fly has an opportunity to sink to a, you know, to a greater depth in slower, you know, maybe denser, more pressured water. Um, while the line that inevitably has to go through the fast stuff, you know, overtakes it until you're, you know, back in control. The idea is that you're giving it time to sink down there and that nice hackle that you put on there acts as a sea anchor at depth and you're able to get that fly deep and hold it deep, you know, with that line passing through the faster stuff. The more vertical that you can uh, approach the water column, the better off you are for getting that stuff super deep. Um, the more you, your line has to go sideways through it, the more it's going to, you know, the less contact you're going to have, the more it's going to be ripped away. So, uh, you know, how do we do that? How are we going to land the fly upstream, land the fly downstream? Um, what you're going to do is you're going to use uh, little tiny circles. And they may be little tiny circles like, you know, you're tracing the letter J. Um, or it may be a big open, you know, curve like, like you know, a big huge U but you're doing these little circles. And the way that it works is if I am casting and you know I do my standard back cast and on my forward cast, I loop to my right, the fly is gonna land to my left. If I loop to the left, the fly is gonna land to my right, okay? Um, and again, you know, if I do it little like that, little J, it's gonna be a little tiny loop. If I do a big one like that, then that line's gonna be completely open up. Um, when we approach the water, you know, left to right helps us, but it doesn't help when we're talking about water, you know, so I start to talk about up current and down current, and that's what I'll do for the rest of the time. But just for right now, understand, you know, if I do this, my fly's going to land over there. If I do that, my fly's going to land over there. The fly's going to land the opposite of wherever you end your cast. Um, so that's how, I, that's how I manipulate, you know, flies in that depth. If I am fishing this, and I'm casting to this slow stuff, you know, up here. And, you know, maybe I cast a couple times upstream like this. And I just, you know, I, actually in this case, I would have just a little bit of a U this way. And that fly would land upstream of my line. And I would get some shallow upstream drifts. And maybe I want to do that first because a shallow upstream drift is like the least invasive presentation, right? Shallow upstream dead drift. If I don't get a fish by doing that, but I think it's a likely lie, and I'm like, dude, there's a fish there. You still not it. Yeah. Right, yeah. Then maybe, because I did the chillest thing first. Yeah, right. Maybe now I, I do the opposite. So instead of jaying like this, landing the fly upstream, maybe now I cast with a tight J like that, land the fly downstream of my line, and get a deeper upstream dead drift presentation. And it can be substantially deeper. I mean, if you do it, if you get it right, it can be substantially deeper. So, you know, now I've done my upstream shallow, my upstream deep, you know, upstream shallow, super chill presentation, least spooky, lines off the water, all that stuff. Down, uh, you know, upstream deep, little, little more spooky. There's a little bit more tippet cut in the water. You know, you're kind of shoving the fly in their face a little bit more. Um, as I move up and around there, then I'm going to start doing my downstream presentations and they work more or less the same way. So if I cast, you know, if I'm now fishing downstream to that, if I cast with 
an upstream loop like that, my fly is going to land downstream. And maybe I, I actually most downstream presentations I might want that because one of the things that that does is it allows me to be in control and in contact with my fly the second it hits the water. So there's no wasted time. So maybe I'm doing an upcurrent loop to land my fly downstream when I'm doing downstream presentations. But maybe I want to you know keep that or, you know sink that fly a little bit or something else. I may reverse that. Um, as I'm doing that, I'm not only playing with depth but I'm also choosing how to align my, my line with the current. If, you know, I'm looking up here, I might cast over here into that stuff, right? Uh, the, the, like, boulder that's half submerged in the middle of the stream with the water going over it. If I'm standing, you know, right where we're sitting, and I cast into that thing like this, straight overhand, no matter what, I don't care how ultralight your setup is. I don't care if you're using, you know, the latest 13X competition tippet. It has mass and you're gonna get drag. So if I just cast straight into that, and you, we'll try this here in a minute. If I cast straight into that and start my drift, chances are my fly's not gonna stay in that current. It's gonna, I'm gonna have, a, it's gonna end up two, three feet closer to me than where I, where I landed that cast because of that cross current drift. To negate that, to negate that, you know, tether, I would want to do a downstream mend by casting into that and doing a downstream loop in like basically at the same vector as the current. I land my fly upstream, that little bit of tippet gets caught in the current and is aligned, you know, in the well, same vector with the current. The exactly. So you're using, yeah, so you end up using the drag that that tippet creates. You've aligned the vector of that drag with the with the direction of the current. Now you get a you know upstream shallow presentation that is a perfect dead drift that stays over there in the current that you want it in that doesn't get that drag that cross current drag you didn't want. Other times maybe you want a little bit of cross current drag. If I'm fishing downstream, like see that bank over there? There's some really nice water against the bank there. It's like nice cushiony slow stuff, right? That's like good brown trout water. I know that because there's a 12 inch brown trout that we've caught like four times right there. But anyway, um, uh, you know, a really great downstream presentation. If I was fishing downstream to that, I would um, cast, uh, you know, like quartering downstream, land that fly as close to the shore as I possibly can and let it come off in just a little sort of like, you know, a little like curvy J thing. And then maybe I cast three feet further downstream, a little curvy J thing. Um, you know, I'm using drag in that case, you know, I'm casting so that my fly, my line is just a little bit, you know, across that current. And by doing that, I get a, a little bit of drag that whips that fly in, in that. In that case, you're not fishing, you're not fishing up and down layers, you're fishing right. like. Sideways. Sideways. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, in that case, I'm using that drag, you know, in a way that I want. When you have a boulder and you have that current coming around it it's the same thing if i sit here and i'm casting you know above that boulder um you know i'm going to end up smacking the rock because that current doesn't stay aligned with me even if i align myself you know in the beginning as that current comes over here it's going to wrap around so instead what i do is i cast upstream with a little bit of a downstream j in the line in line with that so that my fly lands up here, but my tippet is in that is you know aligned with that side current, and my fly will wrap beautifully around that boulder without touching anything. Gotcha. So lots of different ways to do it, but you know ultimately the idea is you figure out where your fish are, you consider doing upstream shallow, upstream deep, downstream shallow, downstream deep, with and without manipulation. That order basically gives you you know what your you know most in, or least invasive to most invasive is right. Um, you know, by the time I'm doing downstream deep with manipulation, I'm like screaming at the, in the fish's face. Um, you try to do that to every likely lie. And the way that you do that is by using these aerial mens to align your fly in different manners, you know, with the current. Um, do you want to try some of the loop stuff and kind of get a feel for it? Yeah, yeah. Why don't you show we get, yeah, we can do some of that. See the line well enough. I'll cast over by the, the dark truck to hopefully illustrate it. But if I cast, you know, 
straight like this, that fly's just going to land directly in front of my, you know, in front of my rod, Slapping right? The J's in line. Right, yeah. Um, if I loop to my right, then that fly is going to land to the left. And, you know, watch my hand a couple times. You know, all, it's literally a normal back cast, and it's just this tiny little J. You know, I actually even bring it up like a J, yeah. right? So that's all it is. And it, if, so if I go left, fly lands right. If I go right, fly lands left. Yeah, that makes, that's so stupid. That's it. This makes that. Right. Because I learned uh, bass fishing, chucking streamers, to get underneath real low hanging stuff on a leg. Yeah. I do like this kind of roll thing where I get it to hit and then like unloop. Right. about two feet down. And yeah. Close to the bank. Yeah, well, and, and that's exactly what I'm going to do out here. So if I want to, if I want to tuck underneath that car, I may, I may start here. But then I'm going to rotate down like this, and all of a sudden my line, you know, unrolls underneath the car. So that's, you know, there's different ways to use these loops, but the boulder situation, right? Understanding of physics is key. Right, yeah. The boulder situation. If I, you know, cast directly above that boulder, I get that, you know, drag and I hit the front of the boulder. But if I cast above it and I loop, you know, like that, then I get the drag that follows it around, you know, it loops around. So that's the, you know, and I, and I can do it on either side of the boulder. If I'm fishing downstream and I want to make sure that that fly lands and I'm super tight on it, maybe I cast and I have a huge, you know, upstream loop. Maybe even, I do this a lot, Oni does this a ton. Maybe I actually cast over this shoulder and I end here. And that gives you that like really nice straight line contact with your fly immediately, right. Um, one of the nicest ways to kind of get used to loading a rod with these loops is to play around with figure eights. Just see if you can keep your load, you know, or your rod loaded all the time. And then at some point, just unwind it, you know, in whatever direction you want. I'm getting everything out on the stream side. I'll chuck the whole wand out of the wind. Yeah, and do it. So that's, so that's what I do. So after I tie on, you know, I don't even let my line you know, straighten out. After I tie on, um, I'll start with the fl my fly in, the, in my hand and I'll just immediately start doing this and then I'm, you know, casting. If I want to move through water, how many times have you just, you know, let your fly, you know, and then you get fucking caught in a boulder and you got to turn around? Well, instead of that, you know, when you're ready to move, I just keep, you know, the fly in the air, you know, moving and then you can unfurl. But playing around with that, those figure eights, you can start to learn how you how to load and unload the rod in loops, because that's what you're doing. You're doing loops. So there's an infinite, you know, different, you know, examples of how to use this, um, and that's what I love about Oni Tenkara. You know, some of the other Tenkara masters sort of have like, you know, these are the five methods, or you know, these are the these are the three ways. But with Oni, it's it's infinite you know, possibilities. It's infinite combinations based on a few, you know, sort of, you know, guiding principles. Yeah. Right. 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 So playing with this stuff, the, playing with those loops, man, it opens up an entire world. Um, you know, being able to cast you know, in tighter quarters than you ever thought you could before, um, being able to align your fly with the current, being able to sink it deep or keep it shallow, you know, just depending on the way you want to present the fly. And then, you know, things like being able to avoid that drag that we talked about. Let's go out here real quick. It's actually going to be hard for me to not use loops. But imagine if this, this is going to end up being sort of a back cast, you know, down low, which, by the way, this is another loop. Um, a lot of times if you don't have, um, you know, if I want to fish that out there, there's no way I'm getting away with an overhand cast. I've got that little opening right there. So I'm going to do a sidearm back cast. But if I just end sidearm forward cast, I'm going to have a whole bunch of line on the water, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to throw a little loop in my forward cast. I'm going to back cast sidearm, and when I forward cast, my rod's going to come up like this on the end. So if I do that into this, you know, drift right here, 
Ah, what a, what a great example. So I can get my fly out there, you know, and keep it up, right? Where it needs to be. Now, one thing you can see though, is that as I'm doing this, you know, it's nice that I can keep my line off the water, but pay attention to where my fly lands, if you're able to see it, and where it ends up at the end of my drift. And what you'll see is that because I have the line going this way, it's being dragged two, three feet, you know, in five, in, you know, five feet this way, I go two, three feet sideways. So I started over there, I ended, you know, way closer than where that fly first landed. And that's not me pulling the fly towards me, that's literally me just trying to like, you know, hold the line off the water. That line has mass, I'm using 6X tippet and 2.0 level line. There's enough mass there that it's gonna yank me across current. So what I have to do is one of those, you know, men's that I talked about, and in this case, I want to, you know, I want to align my line with that fast current on the top to keep my fly over there. So that means I'm going to end my uh, cast with a downstream loop like this. And I'm going to try and do it in that vector. Okay, same vector as the current. So hopefully you can appreciate that, you know, now my line is more aligned with the current and I'm, you know, keeping my fly way further out there than I was before. Now this is all relative, you know, shallow presentations. There's a little bit of weight to this hook, so it wasn't like directly on the surface, but if I want to reverse that and get it, a, you know, down to the bottom in this water, then I need to take that fly and I need to get that little bit of upstream, right, so that my fly lands downstream of the line fly sinks as the water, you know, the line overtakes it. And right there, I'm smacking the bottom. So that ends up being a much deeper presentation than I was doing when I just did, you know, that. I'll see if I can do it in the clearer water here. You might be able to see my fly. Like my fly is right on the surface there. I don't know if you can see it. And then compare that to this. I'm actually on a rock there. <laughs> but it's a much deeper presentation because I'm landing that fly down, fly sinks as the line overtakes it. Make sense? We talked about, uh, I mentioned briefly how Oni will float a fly on the surface and sink at the next cast. The way he does that is by playing with currents in the same way. The way he floats flies is basically your fly has mass. You need to find a current that's going to exert an equal, uh, you know, or greater force, you know, to buoy that fly up. So, you know, it's super easy when you're kind of relatively downstream because any little current you cast, you hold that you know, rod tip up and the, and, the, and the fly skates there. 
you don't want usually like just a total skate with this V-wake coming off your fly, right? But if you get good enough at that, you can not only do it in current where it's kind of like intuitive, like, you know, like that, right? That's, that's me like skating the fly right on top of the water. You can do it not only there, but you can do it in places that you wouldn't figure you would otherwise would, like in back eddies, in the pillowy water. There's this actual thing uh, uh, in hydrology called turbulent bursting. Turbulent bursting is what causes those pillows a lot of times. What happens is this crazy pressure differential builds up between all this water getting shoved down, right, and sort of building pressure down there, and the water it's displacing up towards the surface. And at some point it has to release that pressure gradient and it goes bloop. Yeah, right, exactly, yeah. The crazy thing is, is you, that happens usually, not always, but that usually happens with a very regular period. So if you start paying attention to that pillowy water and you learn the timing of like a particular pillow or a particular burst, then you can use it to either sink your fly directly to the bottom if you, if you cast on the side of where it's about to burst, then it'll drag your fly all the way to the bottom. Or, you know, keep it like, you know, skated on the surface because you ride that current coming up. I don't have a good example of that here. No, I know what you're talking about. That's called, yeah. like a, what's that called, do you say? It's called turbulent bursting. Turbulent that's, bursting. that's the technical, that's yeah, term. right. Okay. This is what happens when you read textbooks in your spare time. I like that. I like that. Yeah, right, yeah. So I might, uh, it's really not a great spot, but I'll, I'll try and show you uh, real quick, just to kind of finish up. I'll try and show you, you know, how it might all come together so that I can go around trees, align with current, upstream, downstream, etc. just in this little tiny chunk here. It'll take like five minutes. Of course. See, I told you it only take five minutes. I lost my fly there. So I'm fishing without a fly, but I'm, I'm trying to illustrate the point, you know? Yeah. So depending on what you, you know, how you use those aerial mens, you change the presentation of the fly. And by giving the fish a couple of different presentations, you up your chances dramatically without having to swap flies 80 times, without having to change weight, without having to put on floating or anything else. My fly spends way more time in the water where it can actually catch fish as opposed to you know spent time rigging i've been learning as i do it been learning how to work around uh, 
you know, trees, rocks, and clear down to cast into the tire spots. Right, yeah. Yeah. And that is, I was actually going to do that over there, but I lost my fly before I got there. But is it really? So, I mean, that's a, that's a perfect example. I'll, I'll, you know, put on another, I don't even have to put on a fly. But, like, there's actually a really nice current. I've caught a fish there already uh, this weekend. But you yeah. see this current over here? Like, if it was me, I would, like, sidearm it out, try to get it to yeah, like, right. wrap around. You could, you could try and get it, like, you know, straight sidearm from the back, you know, like that, right? Yeah. But it's pretty, you know, it's pretty deep in there. If, uh, you know, if I had a wall of a veg over here and I couldn't sidearm, then maybe I back cast and roll under, you know, back cast, whip, uh, whip under. Like that. So there's a couple different ways, you know, you can straight sidearm it or you can just, you know, use that whip. But I actually caught a fish over here. You know, I came to about here and I could kind of get a little bit of a cross, you know, cross current drag. And I was using this as like, you know, stealth, right? But I actually caught him by reversing it like that and doing, doing like a, you know, a downstream pulse presentation. It's wild because, you know, when you're in the when you're in the 45 degree zone, you know, when you're upstream, 45 like, you know, the pie slice up here, the quarter pie slice up here, you can really only do upstream shit. When you're downstream here, pie slice quartering downstream, you can pretty much just do downstream stuff. But in the middle, you know, those two those that half a pie right here, you can do whatever the hell you want. You can do upstream shallow, upstream deep, downstream shallow, downstream deep. You can do whatever the hell you want. So most of my fishing is, is you know, oriented in that pie slice. And that's a good example right there. Like I can, you know, standing at that rock, I can hit that run upstream shallow, upstream deep, downstream shallow, downstream deep without having to move. But all with loops. That's what, that's what does it.